Welcome to this guest speaker presentation from Family Councils Ontario, Antibiotic Stewardship, What It Means and Why It Is Important. It is presented by Dr. Fred Mather, who is a physician working in long-term care and the current president of the Ontario Long-Term Care Clinicians. This webinar is presented by Family Councils of Ontario. Our mission is to lead and support families in improving quality of life in long-term care. We do this by working collaboratively with our partners to cultivate effective family councils, mobilize knowledge exchange through events such as this, and advance public policy, system planning, and research. My name is Samantha Peck. I am the Director of Communications and Education for Family Councils of Ontario, and it is now my pleasure to turn it over to the speaker for this section, Dr. Fred Mather. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you, Family Councils of Ontario, for inviting me to talk on what I think is a very important topic for families and caregivers of those we look after in long-term care. Thank you to Lorraine Purden and Samantha Peck for their interest and assistance in putting this presentation together. My objectives for this presentation are on the next slide. And they are to explain what antibiotic stewardship is, what do we mean by it. Second is to detail the challenges and risks of treating infections in a care home. Specifically, it'll be long-term care, but there's a lot of general principles here that apply to the elderly and disabled in general, and those living in the home or retirement homes. And finally, to advise on appropriate antibiotic stewardship in order to avoid risk to those that we look after. Now, a little bit about myself. I am a family physician. I have always had an interest in long-term care and have practiced in different settings over the past 36 years. I have been medical director of Sunnyside Home in Kitchener for the last 20 years. Sunnyside Home is the regional home for the region of Waterloo. I'm also attending physician at Forest Heights Long-Term Care in Kitchener and Columbia Forest Long-Term Care in Waterloo. And I'm currently the president of the Ontario Long-Term Care Clinicians. Let me just tell you a little bit about the Ontario Long-Term Care Clinicians. In, in this slide, you'll see our current board of directors. And you can see that our vision and mission are, is very similar to what was just given to you as that of the Family Councils of Ontario. Our vision is, is that all Ontarians in long-term care will receive excellent care. And we carry this out by promoting education, advocacy, and engagement. We have an annual concert, conference called Long-Term Care for the Practicing Clinician. This year, the title will be Practical Pearls in Long-Term Care. This is the largest conference in Canada for physicians and other clinicians practicing in long-term care. And finally, we advocate for the residents who are living in long-term care facilities through dialogue with the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and other stakeholders, including family councils, in long-term care. So let me look at a definition for antibiotic stewardship. An antibiotic stewardship program can refer to coordinated interventions designed to improve and measure the appropriate use of antimicrobials or antibiotics by promoting the selection of the optimal drug regimen to treat infections. That comes from the definition of the Infectious Disease Society of America. Um, more practically, it is to choose the appropriate antibiotic treatment when there are the right indications for treatment. And most importantly, and I'll probably dwell mostly on this final part of the definition, is to avoid antibiotic overuse and antibiotic resistance. Now let me um, now just give you a slide that I'm also going to show at the end of the uh, pre presentation. 
to highlight the risks involved with inappropriate antibiotic prescribing. Now, the first three on the list here apply to any medication that we prescribe. We're concerned about adverse effects, and this includes allergic reactions. And um, allergic reactions, once will limit our choice of treating conditions that may occur after we know that there's a drug allergy. We're concerned about drug interactions, and that is especially true in our residents in long-term care who tend to be on multiple conditions for different con uh, illnesses. And there's always the concern about cost to the system. But the other two risks, I think, are especially true for long-term care. We're concerned about antibiotic resistance. And you hear repeatedly about the emergence and concern of superbugs in our care facilities. Terms such as MRSA and VRE, which stands for multimicrobial um, resistant staph um, um, aureus and vancomycin resistant enterococcus are very common in our homes. We are especially concerned with frequent antibiotic use about the incidence of Clostridium difficile infections, which can cause a infection of the intestinal system that can be very hard to treat. And misdiagnosis is important too because it is often too easy to find bacteria in the urine, for example, and use that as the d diagnosis to treat something that might have a different cause altogether. Now, in today's talk, I will talk a lot about bacteria in the urine and ur urinary tract infections. It shows, I think, mostly where the concerns and need for antibiotic stewardship exists in long-term care. The other two major groups of infections that we treat with antibiotics in long-term care are respiratory tract infections and skin and soft tissue infections. In order to uh, show to you why inappropriate prescribing of antibiotics is a concern, let me show you this in terms of variability in long-term care. This next slide shows a graphic of variations in variability in long-term care. Now, in Ontario, we have uh, about 635 long-term care homes. And the resident populations may vary, whether it's rural or urban. Some perhaps deal more with behavioral problems. Other have a younger clientele and some cater to different ethnic groups. Although I th think for the most part, the uh, needs and medical care of the residents in our long-term care home are pretty much the same. And so one would expect a certain consistency amongst all the homes in the pro province, allowing for the fact that there are slight differences in the resident um, populations and so some variation in the variability. Now this variance in statistics has been looked at, at other indicators in long-term care. The next slide shows the variability of antipsychotic prescriptions in long-term care. This is from Health Quality Ontario data from the year of 2015-2016. And you see across the graph here, we have the number of residents without psychotics, without psychosis using antipsychotic medications in long-term care. And this looks at the spread of 621 homes. It goes from as low as 0.7% to as high as nearly 60%. Now, there may be a very good reason for this wide variation in use, but it does urge us to ask, why is there such an extreme 
One reason is, is the indicator itself, which deals with psychosis in the um, individual that's being treated. And there are other legitimate reasons why antipsychotics are, are maybe prescribed in long-term care. But the point here is, is that there's a wide variability. And I would suggest that if you saw this same graph even a few years before this year, you would see even more so because reduction of antipsychotics in long-term care has been a special project over a number of years. And we've seen two things. This is that this um, quality indicator has not only gone down, but there's less variation in the use as facilities compare their use with others across the province. The next slide shows another um, quality indicator in long-term care where we see a wide um, spread of use, and that is using the current um, parameters, the potentially avoidable emergency department visitors from long-term care. And th this shows the 13 different lens in Ontario, and the statistic down the right-hand side is the uh, number of avoidable emergency department visits across the different lens. And it ranges from low of 18 per 100 to a high of 27.4 per 100 residents. The um, target for this, this um, in indicator is um, 12. So we all have work to do to um, avoid transfers in to the emergency department in avoidable cases. I, I find this um, one particular indicator is interesting because you try to look for reasons why, let's say, Toronto Central has a high um, number of transfers, and it could be because of the urban setting where there's um, more hospitals nearby. But on the other hand, the next um, higher highest transfer rate would be the Northeast Lynn, which is very rural and mostly remote, and, and the same would not apply there. So it, when you see variation, it often um, requires some digging in order to analyze why it is so. This indicator, too, is of interest to today's talk. That, uh, drug resistance to bacteria because we know that one of the big factors with antimicrobial resistance in long-term care is residents acquiring resistant bacteria in the hospital, whether it be in the emergency department or after they're admitted, and then bringing it back to the nursing home there always needs to be precautions in order to prevent spread of organisms such as MRSA or VRE. So let's get back to the topic of antibiotic prescribing in long-term care. The next slide is a graphic that was produced by Public Health Ontario last year, and it will be followed by another slide that will highlight some of the um, points of this um, particular infographic. But it does say that, asks what is the problem? And it says that 50% of antibiotic courses are unnecessary. And 78% of residents receive at least one antibiotic course each year. How are antibiotics overused? And this is what impresses me most about this um, graphic is, is that there is a variability in prescribing. Homes with the highest use are using 10 times more antibiotics than homes with the lowest use. Prescriber preference is the key reason for differences, not resident characteristics. So that tells us that the variability is not so much due to the difference in the types of residents that are in different homes, but rather to the prescribers, the care providers who are looking after the individuals in those homes.
Why is this important? Residents in homes with higher antibiotic use experience more harm. And let's go to the next slide here, which um, just highlights those points. Again, the 50% of courses in long-term care are felt to be unnecessary. 78% of residents receive at least one antibiotic course each year. There's a 10 times variability in prescribing antibiotics. And there's a 24% increase in risk to those homes that are the higher prescribing homes. And a big concern is the, the Clostridium difficile or C. diff infections. This is an infection that's quite common. It can give um, a severe diarrheal illness. We usually treat it with an oral drug called metronidazole or flagyl. But again, it's a smart germ and it can develop resistance to the flagyl. And then we use a more potent antibiotic called vancomycin, which uh, may not be wholly effective and people might develop a chronic infection, and it is a too common cause of death in long-term care. A resident can develop diarrhea for other causes. As mentioned before, there's always the concern of allergic reaction and other adverse effects and greater antibiotic resistance overall. So from this um, Public Health Ontario graphic, there are specific recommendations uh, of what, what we can do. And, and they are reduce unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions, reassess the need for antibiotics regularly, and use the shortest effective duration possible. That last point is something we're, we're learning about because uh, we've always been told that you should take an antibiotic for the length of time that it's prescribed. And that length of time may be seven to 10 days. The trend now is to, even for severe infections such as pneumonia, use shorter duration of antibiotic therapy, which is felt to be just as effective with the antibiotics we currently use. The shorter courses do reduce the risk of antibiotic resistance. Okay, next slide, please. Now, the um, statistics that I presented in that Public Health Ontario infographic were done by the research done by Dr. Nick Daneman at Sunnybrook in Toronto. And this is Dr. Daneman um, giving a workshop at our annual conference on antibiotic stewardship and long-term care. This was an interesting session because through an app on our smartphones, we could respond to some live polling. And in a short time, I'll show you what um, the responses were to one of those questions. But let's now talk about um, bacteria in the urine and what makes the aging bladder different, and what do we define as a urinary tract infection? So the next slide shows you that the bladder is basically a ball of muscle, and it's a very simple organ in that respect. But there are changes that occur in the bladder, especially in aging, and I know that we look after many younger people in long-term care as well, but many of these changes apply to the bladder of someone with, say, multiple sclerosis or an early onset Parkinson's disease. The bladder loses its contractility over time. It is a muscle, and like the muscles elsewhere in our body, we lose muscle mass as we get older. Muscle is taken over by either fat or fibrous tissue. And on the bladder, there's more fibrous or scar tissue with aging which means it doesn't expand as well and it loses its ability to contract down. The younger, healthy bladder will empty completely after voiding, whereas the aging bladder are more likely to have a residual urine left over. And that residual urine in the bladder then becomes a medium for bacteria to multiply. 
This is further complicated in the male by the prostate gland, which enlarges the prostate gland is a donut-shaped gland that goes around the urethra, that passage where urine leaves the bladder, and um, will cause further obstruction and even in, and increase the residual urine in the bladder. In the female, we're more likely to get into problems related to pelvic floor relaxation, often related to childbirth. This can um, create a pocket of urine. For example, there is a condition called a cystocele where a pocket of urine can form at the back of the bladder into the vagina, leaving another place for um, stagnant urine to allow bacteria to multiply. There's also the problems with incontinence, and it could be stress incontinence because of pelvic floor relaxation. Stress incontinence where it, it is very easy to lose control of the bladder with a cough, sneeze, or straining. Or there may be very commonly urge incontinence too, where again, because the bladder has lost some of its elasticity, it doesn't expand as well, and one has uncontrollable urges to um, go before the capacity is full. And I think of particular importance is, is there, there's a decline in the local immunity of the bladder too. Now, the young healthy bladder is sterile. Normally there's no bacteria in the bladder at all. But it becomes in, in part like our skin and our intestines where it becomes colonized with bacteria. In fact, our skin is healthy because it carries bacteria that helps with the resistance of the skin. Likewise, bacteria coat our um, bowels and have functions in di digestion. Because of uh, changes in the bladder, including the fact that there's this residual urine often in the bladder, bacteria migrate into the bladder and they become common there. They become what's considered the normal flora. Flora refers to the harmless bacteria that we carry on our skin and in our, our, our bowels. And so the defenses of the bladder changes. One final point in looking at this picture of the bladder is at the top you'll see the, um, the ureters, which are the tubes that carry the urine from the kidney to the bladder. And they are important to note because one of the risks of having bacteria in the bladder is the risk that it will migrate up the ureter into the kidneys and then into the bloodstream where it will cause a much more serious infection. This is something we do have to be mindful of. However, we know that just trying to sterilize the urine in a person's bladder to make it like a young person's bladder does not work to prevent that complication. It doesn't work unless there's clear signs that those bacteria in the bladder are causing an infection. So let me just mention some common urine tests which you have heard about and maybe are familiar with. The urine dipstick is used often in your doctor's office or in the emergency department. That is when they take a urine sample, they can put a test strip in the urine and they can tell by the reactions along the test strip whether there's um, microscopic amounts of blood or white blood cells present and there's different chemical reactions that can be of use in diagnosing uh, infection or other bladder and kidney pro problems. The next um, step that we all often use is what we call the um, urinalysis, which includes the chemical tests that are much the same as what's done in the simple dipstick, as well as microscopy, that is looking at the urine under a microscope in order to see um, whether there's blood or white blood cells or other signs of an infection or kidney condition in the um, urine. When it comes to treating infections, 
in the bladder and the urinary tract. We're particularly interested in the urine culture and sensitivity. This is the test that it usually takes about 48 hours to get a result back. And this is where they take uh, a sample of the urine and spread it on a Petri dish and grow whatever bacteria are in the urine. So that's the culture part of it. The sensitivity refers to uh, antibiotic um, buttons they have on the, the Petri growth, the agar, that can tell us how sensitive or resistant certain antibiotics are to the organism that is grown in the urine. Now, in, in the elderly, especially the frail elderly who may be incontinent, the dipstick and the urinalysis is not very helpful at all. It's not helpful because they do give a large number of false positive results that can be misleading. For example, just like it may be normal to see bacteria in the urine, in the um, aging bladder, it's also normal to see a lot of white blood cells which would go along with having the bacteria there. And you cannot really use that information to say, yes, you got an infection in the bladder. There are very good resources available on um, appropriate testing and prescribing for urinary tract infections. The next slide gives a website through Public Health Ontario on UTI itself and specifically it's about treating UTI in long-term care. Um, at that same website rather than the initials UTI you can also put in ASP and get further information about Public Health Ontario's antibiotic stewardship program. So the next slide gives reasons why Public Health Ontario developed the UTI program. It is common to find bacteria in the urine of the elderly, but it does not always mean that they have a UTI. Older people are often given antibiotics for what healthcare providers and other caregivers assume to be UTIs. UTI, by the way, stands for urinary tract infection. It can be harmful to treat somebody with antibiotics when they don't need them. Antibiotic use can increase the risk of antibiotic resistance, which makes it more difficult to treat future infections. And the next program tells us five key practice changes that are recommended to change antibiotic prescribing. Next slide, please. What are the five key practice changes involved in the UTI program? Obtain urine cultures only when residents have the indicated cl clinical signs and symptoms of a UTI. Obtain and store urine cultures properly. Prescribe antibiotics only when specific criteria have been met and reassess once urine culture and susceptibility results have been received. Do not use dipsticks to diagnose UTI. Discontinue routine annual screening and screening at admission if residents do not have indicated signs and symptoms of a UTI. We, and that recommendation comes because of the high incidence of asymptomatic bacteriuria. Asymptomatic bacteriuria means that there is bacteria in the urine, but if the individual is not having any symptoms, such as lower urinary tract symptoms, fever, pain, or change in their mental status, the bacteria are part of the normal flora in the, the bladder. When I refer to lower urinary tract symptoms, often referred to as LUTs. They include urinary discomfort when voiding or dysuria, urinary frequency going to the bathroom often, nocturia, which means going more often at night, 
or any blood that's present in the urine. So the next slide just highlights what antibiotic stewardship means in long-term care. It means reduce unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions. Reassess our needs for antibiotics regularly. And when we use an antibiotic, use it for the shortest effective duration possible. So the next slide shows the result of the live polling from the workshop that I um, had a picture of pre previously. And the audience in this workshop would consist of physicians, nurse practitioners, and phar phar pharmacists. And using an app on the smartphones, phones, people were asked to type in the response to questions that Dr. Denneman presented. And the question here is, what is the most common reason for unnecessary antibiotic initiation in long-term care? And, and the size in which the response is, represents the number of people who gave that particular response. And you can see that family is the largest response there. And that tells us that clinicians who prescribe the antibiotics often feel pressure from families to start an antibiotic, perhaps even if they think that it is not necessarily indicated. Now, in all fairness to family members, if you put nurses, staff, nurse, nursing together, probably pressures from staff are even um, greater than pressures from the family. The next slide um, just refers to Choosing Wisely, and you may be familiar with the Choosing Wisely program, which has become very popular in the United States and Canada. It's aimed at both people who give and receive care to make wise choices with respect to their care. Last January, the Long-Term Care Medical Directors Association of Canada developed their own Choosing Wisely recommendations. These are six specific recommendations that refer to long-term care homes in Canada. And recommendation number three is don't do a urine dip or a urine culture unless there are clear signs and symptoms of a urinary tract infection. And if you look this up, and I encourage you to do so because it, it again gives a good explanation. It, it explains why we don't recommend urine dips and urine cultures unless uh, there is a clear indication. The American Medical Directors Association have come up with 10 recommendations on their Choosing Wisely list, much the same as the Canadian list. And uh, it, it, it's a list that I like to not only refer to myself, but I, I share with um, residents and um, uh, families so they have a better understanding of the background of some of the recommendations that I may be making. So how do we know when or if the bacteria in the urine might represent an infection or not. And there are several algorithms out there that help us make that decision. An algorithm is like a flow chart that lets you assess the problem and work through it on a step-by-step -step basis. For example, the McGeer criteria has been around for a long time and is often referred to and it's being updated. It's commonly used in long-term care. Um, Dr. Mark Loeb has developed an algorithm. Dr. Loeb is from McMaster and it's um, he's done a lot of research in this field. Um, the CDC Center for uh, Infectious Diseases in Atlanta have a very good criteria as well. And I won't go through these algorithms in a lot of de detail, but I've chosen one which is shown on the next slide. And th this is from a website. Uh, it's um, dubugsneeddrugs.org, and it's been developed in Alberta and is used in the Alberta long-term care homes. And this is just part of the algorithm here, but I think it, it is one that really 
gives us a clear understanding of how we should approach urinary tract infections in a long-term care facility. On the left-hand side, we have the individual who does not have an indwelling catheter, and then on the right-hand side, the person who has an indwelling catheter because the management is a little bit different. For the person who has an indwelling catheter, the likelihood that they are having bacteria in their urine at any time is almost 100%. The reason for that is, is that the catheter is a foreign body in the bladder and bacteria will cling to any foreign body. And even if you do prescribe antibiotics, you're not fully eradicating the bacteria from that foreign body. One can change the um, catheter, but that is a, a approach of mixed benefit in some ways because the new catheter then becomes um, colonized again. And also the trauma of changing a catheter may be a time to reintroduce more bacteria into the bladder. So on the left-hand side, there are certain criteria when you're treating an individual. And um, we're looking for symptoms of infection. So if they have acute dysuria, that is any of those lower urinary tract symptoms are referred to, and a fever, one is more likely to think that there is indeed an infection there. But either one of those alone needs further evidence of an infection. And this algorithm recommends either um, new or increased frequency, urgency, or incontinence, or pain in the flank. That usually means the um, ureters are inflamed, or pain in the suprapubic region that's over the bladder, or actual blood in the urine. Now, if their medical status is deteriorating, that is, if um, the fever can't be brought down with the usual acetaminophen, or um, their blood pressure is dropping, or their pulse rate is going up, you're going to treat that person on an empirical basis and not really wait to get any culture results. By empirical, I mean is, is that you have strong reason in those people who are deteriorating that they do have an infection and you want to treat them quickly with the most appropriate antibiotic based on um, your experience in the home and what that person is. But if they're not de de deteriorating, you go across to push fluids. And it's interesting in this algorithm, they're not even suggesting you get a urine culture at that point. Because sometimes people can be having those symptoms because they're a bit dry. And um, by encouraging fluids, it helps to flush out um, perhaps a bacterial overgrowth in the bladder, which antibiotics are not going to change, and help relieve their cyst symptoms. And if pushing fluids doesn't help after 24 hours, um, that's when you would get a urine culture. And uh, if that comes back as being positive, you will treat according to the symptoms, or you may also, also have reasons to look for other diagnosis. And that box is there because it's, it can be too easy to attribute everything to a UTI when we know there's bacteria in the urine. Now, I'm not saying this is the path that all homes and care providers should follow, but it's a representation to a more logical approach to this issue of appropriately identifying and diagnosing a urinary tract infection and thereby either assuring the most appropriate treatment or looking for an alternative diagnosis when there may be something else causing, say, um, a, an acute confusional state in an individual. The next slide shows Dr. Mark Lowe, who also was a presenter at our conference last fall. Dr. Uh, Mark Loeb is a specialist in infectious diseases at McMaster University, and he's done research on infections in long-term care for many years ago. In fact, I've been referring to his algorithm for um, treating urinary tract infections, which is similar to the one I just pre presented for over 20 years now. 
And at this, uh, at, at, at our conference, he reviewed a lot of the current information on infections in long-term care. And the next slide shows you what his research so, shows the types of infection we have in long-term care. The most common type of infection is actually respiratory tract infections, and those are your colds, influenzas, pneumonias, sinus infections, and other related infections. And sometimes the treatment of that is fairly straightforward, but we also know that uh, infections such as uh, the common cold, different types of influenza like illness such as the parainfluenza, which isn't, isn't the same as what we get vaccinated for, and bronchitis in the individual who wasn't a smoker are actually all more likely be, to be due to a viral infection and antibiotics are not effective in that group of people. I won't go into details in this webinar on it, but Dr. Loeb has created similar criteria to approach respiratory tract infections in the nursing home in order to prescribe the most appropriate antibiotic. The next most common infection is the UTIs, which I've concentrated on in this webinar, and that's followed by skin and other infections. Um, the block that refers to prophylaxis refers to um, times when antibiotics are prescribed to prevent possible infections. The most common uh, example of that is if a person has heart valve disease and they're getting dental work done, either uh, aggressive cleaning or dental extraction, the um, oral surgeon or dentist will want antibiotics to be given immediately before and after to lessen the risk of bacteria passing through the bloodstream. A small fraction receive antibiotics for fever alone. There's sometimes a fever that won't go away and an antibiotic may be used to treat an infection on an uncertain site, maybe something like diverticulitis in the bowel. So I thought I would close this presentation by giving you some case examples. These are examples from my own practice and it, it's not hard to find examples. These are all examples that have come to my attention in my care since I started to prepare this webinar last month. So the first example is a 90-year-old woman with moderate to severe dementia. She often becomes agitated in the evening. It's the typical sundowning phenomenon. The nurse at midnight on January 8th finds her more confused, agitated, and short of breath. This nurse was someone who was not familiar with either the resident or the home, and he was understandably concerned about her change in condition. Uh, she was in a delirium. A delirium is an acute confusional state, probably a, a pattern that she normally has where she gets more confused in the evening and um, when the rest of the residents are maybe sleeping she gets up and wanders about because her dementia affects her normal sleep cycle. This nurse called the doctor on call who by the description uh, supported the wish to send this person to the emergency department. She was seen in the emergency department and she returns later the next morning with a prescription for risperidone, which is an antipsychotic, and Cipro, ciprofloxacin, which is commonly prescribed by our emergency physicians for a urinary tract infection. Now, the regular nurse who was on the next day saw the prescription and she knew um, what my usual practice is, and she asked me whether she should start it or not, and I said no. I was coming in that afternoon so I could assess her. When I assessed her, she was extremely tired, um, no doubt because uh, she spent the night on a stretcher in the emergency department and was given sedating medication there. But I found no evidence of a fever, flank pain, su su superpubic pain, or any abnormality to suggest 
um, she had a urinary tract infection. I also did not agree with the prescription of the antipsychotic. Of course, the emergency physician got the story and figured this person was being prescribed for a delirium, and if she is in a de delirium, well, I'll prescribe an antipsychotic. The next slide will show what her urine result from the hospital told me, and um, it, it and and this comes back, as I said, about 48 hours after the fact. So. Um, it shows that she was indeed resistant to the ciprofloxacin or Ciprol, which is the antibiotic that was prescribed. So um, we would have probably have treated her with another antibiotic then if um, we had chosen to treat her with the first one. But her urine also grows what's called an ESDL E. coli. And um, ESDL we're finding more and more of, and that refers to extended spectrum back beta lactamase, which is uh, uh, one of those superbugs that have become resistant to just about every antibiotic that we, we use. And, and we really can't treat it, but we treat it more by public health measures, which means putting the person in isolation and trying to avoid the spread of that organism to other individuals in the facility. So we'll move on to case history number two now, who is a 90-year-old woman, had a fall with a small laceration on the left side of her forehead. She was also sent to the emergency department and the laceration was repaired with dissolvable sutures and there was no evidence of any further significant head injury at all. But she returned to the home with, according to the nurse's notes, confirmed UTI and a seven-day prescription for septra. And septra and Bactrim and related antibiotics are common antibiotics used for urinary tract infections. They're a combination of um, sulfamethoxazole, a sulfonamide medication, and trimethoprim, another um, antibiotic. And so we'll look at her urine result again came back 48 hours later from the hospital and the uh, septra or trimethoprim sulfa methoxazole is right on the top there and indeed she's growing an e coli bacteria in her urine that is sensitive to it so the antibiotic would have been appropriate again although the emergency physician had prescribed it i chose not to treat her and um, she actually was doing fine afterwards and um, you can see that although she's sensitive to a number of those antibiotics, she's uh, resistant to Cipro, so that would not have been a good choice. And she's also um, intermediate to um, Keprosporins, which are used a lot as well. And what you'll find when you look at a lot of these culture results is that if um, there is a trend for people to become resistant to the antibiotics that are used most commonly in the emergency departments and the floors. So as I say in this case, I chose not to treat her because I don't think her fall was related to a urinary tract in infection, especially when she had no other signs or symptoms of a UTI. Now, her daughter um, wondered why I was not treating it, and I called her on the phone about this the next week and explained to her the reasons why, although there was bacteria in her urine, I did not think it was directly related to the fall. It would be more important to look at other causes for her falls and do fall prevention strategies. This woman also has dementia and her confusion fluctuates. The daughter wonders if infection may be contributing to her fluctuating mental state. I do not believe it was in this case, but we did decide that we'll we will go ahead and treat this for a week and then and and this hasn't been done yet because she just be finishing her treatment now we'll see if she feels it makes any difference or not so she doesn't she, she did not from the beginning fulfill the criteria of treatment but we did decide to treat just to see if it made a difference and if it does we might be more apt to treat future episodes where there's a change in her mental condition 
with an antibiotic. But I think it's more likely we'll learn that it probably doesn't really make too much difference one way or another. And it's not worth exposing her to the adverse effects and future risk of antibiotic resistance. And now one final case is case history number three on the last, next slide here. And this is uh, a woman who I saw last week and she had mild dysuria. That is discomfort with voiding and uh, some increase in urinary frequency as well. Again, she is in her 90s. Uh, I did not think the symptoms were that remarkable, although um, the, the nurse did. Perhaps it's a case where it could just be helped by increasing fluids. And this is what her culture shows. She is resistant to the um, septra, which the last person was on. She's also resistant to nit nitrofurantoin, that's usually prescribed as um, a macro bit, another antibiotic that's used a lot in long-term care. Um, but she is sensitive to ampicillin, and we, we did decide to treat her with a short course of amoxicillin, which is really much the same as ampicillin, and we'll see if it makes a di difference. But again, I'm going to be very careful, and if, if it's helped out, it might influence my decision to treat her in the future, but if it didn't make a great deal of di difference, I'm more concerned about increasing resistance in the pattern of E. coli, or, or in this case, the Enterococcus and Proteus, which aren't usual pathogens, that is bacteria that cause infections, because with increased resistance, restricts my choice of antibiotics if she develops a more serious infection at some time in the future. So let me conclude with the next slide, which goes back to the slide I shared with you at the beginning. And that is to highlight the risk of inappropriate antibiotic prescribing in long-term care. We have the increased risk of adverse effects and allergic reactions, and this might restrict um, future use of the antibiotics. We choose to treat a dubious infection. There's the risk of drug interactions, and this is compounded by the fact that our Elderly individuals tend to be on more medications and their ability to excrete medications, usually by way of the kidneys, are reduced as well. And there's the uh, cost to, to the increased cost to the system. But I especially want to emphasize the last two points that inappropriate antibiotic use will increase antibiotic re resistance and limit our choices in the situation of more severe infections. The other aspect of this that is very relevant to long-term care is, is that these people who are cultured, they're not sick, but they're cultured, they grow um, these multi-resistant organisms such as MRSA and VRE in long-term care require repeated swabs and isolation, and it takes up a lot of staff time and other resources if um, we have to manage more and more people with multi-resistant bacteria. And f finally, if we look at individuals too simplistically and see, say, bacteria in their urine, we want to attribute whatever is going on, whether it's a fall, whether it's a delirium, to the bacteria in the urine, and we might be missing other causes that could also be treated. So final slide, and I just wanted to thank you, and I am happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you very much for that really informative presentation. Uh, one question that you may be able to answer, what is the most effective format of reporting from the physician in long-term care to the quality program and board of directors in the home? Uh, is there a formula to accurately compare to other regional long-term care sites? Well, there's, there's different ways to um, look at data, and it's a very relevant question because health quality in Ontario is looking at antibiotic stewardship as a quality indicator, looking at antibiotic use. And the, 
Health Quality Ontario, or HQO, it does provide physicians with their called long-term care practice reports, or now it's re referred to as my practice. They're currently available for antipsychotics, for example. And um, this year, it's one of their projects to um, have antibiotic use available too. So the, the physicians in those homes that prescribe, let's say, 10 times the antibiotics will see that, well, there's a variation, a discrepancy in their practice compared to what the norm is and probably the, the target should be somewhere less than that. So that's comparing individuals. Now one drawback with that, the people who are pro probably should be looking at their statistics the most perhaps don't subscribe to the My Practice Report. In terms of the home level, all homes um, would have some sort of infection control committee which reports to the Medical Advisory Committee, or it's also called the Professional Advisory Committee in some homes. Um, that group is mandated, the Professional Advisory Committee is mandated to meet four times a year. And there's, and at the three homes that I work in, at least, there's always an um, infectious disease report. And I think uh, with time, we'll see more and more of an antibiotic stewardship program um, included in those reports. That is the interface then between the providers and the um, administrators of the home. Great, thank you for that. It helps to know uh, what different quality improvement opportunities there are, particularly with such an important topic like this. Uh, is there documentation available to help educate families on this topic? Is there, are there any resources that you suggest? Uh, I'll um, emphasize two that are included in my slides. The um, Public Health Ontario resource, and it's um, publichealthontario.ca backslash UTI for urinary tract infections in particular in long-term care. And um, if, if, if you use the same URL, publichealthontario.ca slash ASP, further information on anti-stewardship programs. The other resource that I think is good for this topic and other controversial topics in long-term care is Choosing Wisely Canada Long-Term Care. Um, you can go to the Choosing Wisely website, Choosing, Canada, Choosing Wisely Canada website and scroll down to Long-Term Care and get them there. Or if you were just to Google Choosing Wisely Canada Long-Term Care, you'll get them that way. So those are two, I think, very good sites. Um, the other one is the CDC website, Center for Disease Control. That is a, an American um, organization out of Atlanta. They have a lot of um, person-friendly resources. And um, if, if you Google CDC, um, antibiotic stewardship or um, asymptomatic bacteria, um, you, you, you'll find very practical information there. So those are three sites among many in which you can get further information. And I will add that I use sites like that in order to put this presentation together. Great, thank you very much um, for your replies to those questions and for taking the time out of your schedule to uh, educate us on this very important topic. On that note, on behalf of Family Councils of Ontario and all the attendees for the live webinar, as well as those who will be watching the recorded session, another big thank you to Dr. Fred Mather for taking the time to do this presentation for us. And thank you. And on that note, folks, we'll be wrapping up and signing off and have a great rest of your day.